Okay, welcome back to another episode of the AI SDR movement. Today I'm interviewing Sean Whiteley. Today I want to go a little bit deeper on the technology behind AI SDRs. I feel like up to this point we've talked a lot about like what they are, why we need them, the difference that they're making, but you're kind of the technical guy behind the scenes that's helping build this product. So I'm hoping for marketers like me, you can help us dive a little bit deeper into like how we're powering AI SDRs, why it's important, and kind of how we're thinking about building them. Yeah, of course. I mean, this um, it's new, right? I mean, it's it's something that we forget all the time that um, we're very early in, and just like any hype cycle, right? There's a you know, there's a period of extreme hype. There's a lot of investment, a lot of excitement, a lot of enthusiasm, and then of course there's the trough of disillusionment that happens. It's you know, in you know, inevitable. But at some point, right, you start to see like production ROI. And I think um, that that sort of bell curve that happens has been really constricted in terms of how fast it's happened. Um, so I think right now, a lot of people are learning. Uh, they're getting educated. They're experimenting. There's a lot of experimental AI budget out there. And I think um, people are looking to sort of understand what areas of the business are appropriate um, for different things. And I think they're looking to understand you know, what are the possibilities? I think everyone's accepted that um, there's going to be extraordinary productivity gains across various areas of the business, but I think everyone's trying to figure out like within their purview, you know, what are the things that they should be addressing and experimenting with right now? Absolutely. So you mentioned a hype cycle and speaking of hype, I immediately think back to our FY25 kickoff that we did in February and you were up in front of the whole company and you were pitching this concept of an AI SDR. And at that point, Everyone at the company was so excited. You you pitched this vision of this inbound, totally changing the inbound motion from like an AI SDR having conversations to the email that we're seeing now. And everyone on the team got so excited, but we also hadn't seen it in action yet. We didn't really know what it was. As the person who was not only pitching that vision, but you're also helping to build what was going to turn into Piper, the AI SDR. What did that look like for you from the process of like pitching us at FY25 kickoff to getting us to, we did our big launch like mid-April. What was that process like? Yeah, look, I mean, when we started this company, we really one of the things we wanted to do was build um, a better way for SDRs to engage with, with prospects. I mean, SDRs are early in their career, and we put them front and center between a buyer and a seller, and we asked them to have some of those initial conversations. And historically, we've given them a hammer and a nail, email and calendar and a phone. Um, so we set out to sort of bring a lot of data in real time to better inform an SDR about like what type of conversations they should be having, what should they should be talking about. Is it an existing account? Is it upsell, cross-sell? Is it an open opportunity? Is it someone in my ICP? Is it a key industry? Are they looking at my high you know, margin products? All the things, right? So we spent a lot of time on data preparation, like how much data can we get? Everything's digital. Everything leaves tracks. So how much data can we bring in? And so, you know, one of the things that we've always thought about is like, what are the tasks and workflows that are executed by an SDR. But anybody who owns a P&L, they also think about W-2s. So people are your most valuable um, assets, yeah. right? But they're also your most expensive by a huge margin, right? So it was very natural for us to think about like all of the things that we were doing to try to better enable speed and efficiency and intelligence in an SDR the next step is really to like automate even more of those tasks and workflows. And that's kind of why we started to, you know, build this idea of like a fully autonomous AI SDR. Yeah, absolutely. And you talk about autonomous AI SDR, and I think that's really key is autonomous. And, you know, I'm on LinkedIn a lot. And I'm listening to other demand gen folks or marketers. And to your point of earlier, like hype cycles, everyone knows that this is where we have to go, but people are still like in varying levels of how we get there. And I think some new sentiment we're starting to hear a little bit more is like these AI powered products are just chat GPTs repackaged. Like it's no different than chat GPT. It's just in a product with something different slapped on it, but it's the same concept. Now, as someone who uses an AI SDR every day, I know that's not true. But for someone who's listening to this show, can you help us understand what is the difference between something that's just a chat GPT? Where does that end? And then where does something like Piper or an AI SDR begin? Sure, absolutely. I mean, one of the things I feel pretty strongly about is that AI application vendors um, are gonna do extremely well. Um, not all of them, but a lot of them. One of the reasons I think AI application vendors are gonna do well is they have the domain expertise, they have the data, they have the workflow. They have a lot of the things it takes to operationalize this. Like when LLMs came out or foundation models, um, they're, 
very powerful, but they're generic. They're trained on the internet. You know, they're not really like, they don't understand your domain. And so the first thing we started thinking about was data preparation and operationalization. Like, look, everyone's on equal footing in terms of having access to these foundation models and they're powerful and they can do a lot of things, especially around automating language tasks. Things like writing and content generation and all of the things we know that they're extraordinary at, but they don't know your business. They don't know your graph. They don't know your go-to-market. They don't know your routing rules. They don't know your rules of engagement. So you, we, we thought about like, how are we going to help companies make AI their AI, right? Without having to build and train and tune and fine tune their own model, which a lot of companies will and are. But the first thing we thought about was, um, and if you think about it, if you visualized it, we built a system that in sort of there's a couple boxes over here and there's one box over here. That one box over here is a, uh, an LLM and everyone has access to that LLM, right? And everyone's going to start using various LLMs. But over here, there's the data that's unique to your business. So things like orchestration and workflow, things like um, data from your disparate go-to-market systems. And of course, you know, RAG, some, you know, third, bringing in your own data. So We've sort of built it to be LLM agnostic because we know that going forward, some companies might want to build their own LLM or they might train their own or model. And companies will have a variety of different models they use across their business. But we wanted to make sure that like over time, you could take Piper, make Piper yours. So train it, tune it, just like an employee at your company. And then of course, leverage the power of the foundation models and of course, leverage whatever version you you plan on using. Got it. Now, for anyone listening to this that doesn't know what RAG is, can you help us understand what's RAG? Yeah, retrieve log method generation. And really, that's just kind of third-party data that you're using as a part of um, ingestion, right? So things like, for us, Piper, it would be like your website. It would be like knowledge base articles. You know, you can think of RAG as kind of like when you onboard and train an SDR, what are the things that she's going to read to understand? What are the things she's going to need to reference to interact and interface with prospects and customers. So it's kind of like a lot of, you know, the the third party data she uses in her brain. Got it. So that's actually a great segue to my next question about data. And you've talked about that already in quite a few of, of your answers here. But for an AI SDR to be impactful for your organization to drive pipeline and help you book meetings, what kind of data do they need access to? But more importantly, how do they then utilize that data to actually make an impact? Or how are they using that data to create good customer experiences that are good enough to book meetings for your customers? Sure. I mean, one of the core jobs of an SDR is qualification and follow-up. You know, they're kind of, again, like they're trying to make sure that, is this person a good fit for our business? Um, where are they in a buying process? Um, they're trying to be helpful and guide them to helpful resources and answer questions. So we always come back to um, the tasks and workflows that the SDR executes. And it's challenging because a lot of this data resides in different systems. There's CRM systems and marketing automation systems and sales engagement systems. And there's ABM platforms and there's sort of all these different systems. And really what they're trying to understand is like, who is this person? Are they in my ICP? Are they a customer? Are they an open opportunity? If they're a customer, are they a red account or are they a healthy account? Is it upsell, cross-sell? Like they have to ground themselves very quickly in who is this person I'm talking to? And who is this account? And what is our relationship with them? And what does this conversation need to be about? And how do I need to drive it? So that's kind of how we think about sort of the the data piece in terms of what Piper needs to be aware of. So when when you know the the advantage you have with Piper is she can memorize your CRM database, right? So she doesn't need to go sorting through it. She has it memorized. And she also needs to understand, like if you book a meeting, who should it be booked with? Should it be booked with an AE and an SE? Should it be booked with an inside sales rep to do more qualification and discovery? There's a variety of different things that she has to have in her brain, but the the beautiful part is like we've kind of already built a lot of that for an SDR. Now we're taking all that data, but we have to package it up in a way that it can be consumed and leveraged by by Piper, which involves some some preparation on our side in terms of the the, the data preparation, really. Got it. Now, as we think about that same data, and you've talked about giving Piper and AI SDR access to your systems and onboarding them, obviously the next question you think about is security. So you have access to all these systems. You've got all my CRM data. I might be giving you competitive data so you can answer these questions just like I would with an AI S or with a human SDR. With a human SDR, you can say like, hey, this is all proprietary information. You know who you can and can't share it with. 
how do we put safeguards on something like Piper when you give them access to all of that important company information and data? Sure. So for one, there's there's already built in a, a baseline level of moderation in terms of like what types of data are accessible by Piper and also that can be used in these conversations. So there's already like a basic foundation layer. And if you go in there and you try to steer the conversation into a strange direction, she's going to kind of say, hey, that's not my area of expertise. I can't really answer those questions for you. So there's already some baseline moderation. But then secondarily, there's also tuning and fine tuning, right? So um, it's not only about like what information um, can be leveraged as part of Piper's brain, but it's also um, how, how do you want her talking to specific people, right? Whether or not they're top of funnel, bottom of funnel in a different buying stage, whether in your ICP or out of your ICP, like how do you, or whether they're talking to someone they might ask about your competitor. That's a really good example. Um, you can give her instructions. Um, so rules of engagement. So like always say this, never say this, or you can even fine tune it. So like when you say this, I, you know, you, last time you said this, you said it like this, really we'd like to be positioning or messaging in a different way. So we give you a lot of transparency into like why Piper said something. So there's citations so you can understand like, why did she do this? And then you can go back and over time, just like you're ramping a person, you're building your AI to make sure that they're representing your company in a meaningful way. Um, but also um, they're effective in terms of like each interaction that she has, is she really executing that as well as she can? Absolutely. You mentioned the citations. It's so funny. As someone who uses Piper every day, I thought I would never, you'd, or I was like, well, it's nice to have the citations. And one of the use cases I didn't expect to use it for is looking at old stuff on our website that I'm like, oh, you you don't need that. I shouldn't even have that on my website. I've got to change that. So it's so interesting to see that the safeguards that we built for that transparency so you know why Piper is saying what she's saying or what she's using has actually helped our marketing team in other areas we didn't think about of deleting old things from our website that we didn't even know existed because over time you just kind of forget that it's even there. Yeah. I mean, you have to trust it. I mean, trust is a big deal. And I think that's one of the top you know, reasons why people haven't adopted AI is they don't trust it. And a lot of it, you know, they don't understand it, um, but also they don't trust it and you have to build that trust. And so, you know, we, that's why we built the AI scorecard. So, you know, you could kind of build up that trust over time. Um, these are customer interactions. Now, look, in terms of the customer interactions we're having, you know, we're not in healthcare, we're not in financial services, you know, we're not talking about we're not using PII in a lot of our conversations, but at the same time, you still want it representing your business in the right way. So there has to be a way to build up the trust that somebody has. And so, um, and then you also kind of realize when you start talking to companies, every software company on the planet is building AI applications now. And they're all asking you to do all these things, right? So what we're trying to do is reconcile, like what are the things that we can do for you and what are the things actually that you really would like to control on your own? But we're also um, very cognizant of the fact that, that that companies are overwhelmed by AI vendors right now. So we're trying to make sure that we make it as easy as possible, but we, at the same time, we give you as much control as possible. Absolutely. Now, you sit in on a lot of these calls. So you're in a lot of sales calls where people are asking about Piper and about AI SDRs and just AI in general. What are the questions you're getting asked most frequently? Like, what are things that marketers are most concerned about or asking about more often than not in these sales conversations? Yeah, I mean, one is really trying to get an understanding of what are the capabilities and how can I try them and test them? That's, you know, first, of, first, first and foremost, they want to understand, like, what is it? How does this help me? How can I investigate as to whether or not this is a good fit for us? Um, secondly, I think that it's a bit polarizing when you say you have an AI SDR, you know, and to be clear, we have a, the utmost respect for SDRs. We started this company to help SDRs become superhumans. That was the, that was one of our sort of core, you know, missions at the company. Um, so we have a lot of respect for what they do. It's a hard job. Um, but if you walk into a company, you've got a very mature inside sales organization and you've invested in this motion heavily. Um, there's a lot of ways that you might use Piper to help scale, to help sort of offload a lot of these things and keep your people focused on these very high value engagements, interactions, and workflows that they execute. Um, but some people are already sort of there. They already see the writing on the wall and they're saying, you know, this is probably an area that's going to get automated and we want to get ahead of it. And we want to figure it out. So I think the question that I would pose to someone is, how do you see your organization a year from now or 18 months from now? Like, will your organization look the same or different? And how will it be different? And some people have already sort of reconciled the fact that 
you know, if I've got 35 hybrid SDRs, you know, I could probably get more horsepower out of them, moving them over to one function and automating one function or moving them up to higher level functions and automating lower level functions. Um, or some people have said, you know what, I'm just going to have a few people that are going to own the AI and I'm not going to be paying these W-2s. So I think everyone looks at it a little bit differently. And I think the question should not necessarily be like, what it, what does it do and how does it work? Of course, you're going to figure that out. I think the real question is like, what's the future of your organization look like in terms of your org chart and where you want to be spending those dollars? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us today. I think this was a really great episode and hopefully it helps people understand more about how our AI SDR is powered and, and how we use her. So thank you so much for sitting down with us, Sean. My pleasure, Sarah.